Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. In this week's Eccentric Minute, we'll discuss another one of our foundational exercises, and that is the K-Pulley Leg Drive. To execute this, you're going to need to set some sort of support right out in front of you where you're going to be about under your shoulders and allowing your body to extend out at a 45 degree angle. From here, you're going to let your hips sink straight back towards the K-Pulley, and I want you to push as hard as you can with your feet to drive your shoulders up and out at a 45 degree angle by extending your hip, knees, and ankles. This is a great exercise to start training your athletes to be up off their heels and to drive through the ball of their feet and their big toe as we move forward in training. Give this one a shot, guys. I think this is one that you're going to love and your athletes are really going to enjoy. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Before we get to the show, let's play a little game of name association. When I say the names Hank Krasenhoff, Dr. Natalia Verkashensky, Brett Bartholomew, Dr. Charlie Weingroff, Dr. Brian Mann, and Dr. Fergus Connolly, what do you think? Well, if the answer to that was they each have multiple lectures in the Strength Coach Network, then you would be right. On top of these sensational lectures from these six world leaders, we have well over 100 additional lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world, along with an extremely active forum where there's coaches from all over the world discussing everything in the strength and conditioning world. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash cvasps, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash cvasps, to dive into all that great content today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely killer discussion. I get to sit down with TCU Zach Dakin, and we're going to talk about skill development and technique analysis in baseball. After a quick little intro of how we got down to TCU, Zach dives right into it, sharing with us his programming, how he progresses things, and what really led him to write his book, Moving Over Maxes. He then runs down the rabbit hole of Dr. Bondarchuk's classification of exercises and how this has led to his decision-making processes and progressions when dealing with the student-athletes down there in Texas. Next, he shares with us you know, what he's actually looking at, how he's testing and evaluating his athletes, and how he's retesting his athletes to make sure that they're moving in the right, right direction. We finish off going over the, you know, the evolution of training with baseball players that he's seen at his time at TCU, um, and a little bit of a dive into movement over maxes and what brought it about and, and what to expect with it. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Zach, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Excited to be on. Yeah, man, I'm stoked for this. But listen, for the three quarters of a human listening to this right now who doesn't know who you are and where you're at. Let's give them the quick spark notes version of how you got down there to Horn Frog Land. Yeah, I, uh, this is starting my 13th year, I believe, at TCU. Um, baseball and football, I was brought in uh, from the University of Wyoming. Short stint there with football. Prior to that, was with the Anaheim Angels in baseball. Um, had stops at University of Washington, Missouri State as a GA. Um, so this has obviously been my longest stay and, uh, it's, you, you never think you're going to be somewhere this long, but the situation has been so good. Uh, I couldn't ask for anything better. And so here we are. Missouri state, not Murray state. Yeah. Missouri state, uh, it used to be Southwest Missouri, Southwest state, Missouri right? state, man. Yeah. The bears, good old Mo Valley guy. <laughs> See, I knew there was a reason I liked you. I was at Indiana state. Okay. There you go. So yeah, I played football at, uh, it was SMS at the time, but, uh, Graduated SMS, went back as a GA at uh, Missouri State. So that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And now you're you're cooking it with the baseball team down there. Yeah, um, like I like I said when we were talking just a second ago, I've got such a great situation with uh, with our head coach. You know, I've got full autonomy of the program, what we want to do. Uh, you know, baseball for decades, honestly, has been so far behind in physical development, strength and conditioning. You know, for physical performance, whatever you want to call it. It's been so far behind that having full autonomy, um, combining the skill and the physical has, has kept me here at TCU. And it's, it's an amazing situation. Um, because truthfully, 
you know, training athletes, there's no, we can't separate the skill from the physical, right? Those things have to be, they have to be paired together. The weight room, the weight room isn't, um, isn't the end all be all for these athletes. And so we got to make sure that, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're tying those things together, um, inside and outside of the weight room. So the full autonomy he gives me with running programs, conditioning, pitchers throwing, and, and, uh, then what we do in here has, has kept me around. Well, then let's get into what you're doing in there. I mean, if, if people aren't watching right now, you can see there's a milk crate full of baseballs right behind him right now. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about how Zach trains the boys. Let's talk about how this program evolves throughout these young men's career. Sure. So, um, you know, I just wrote the book Movement Over Max is in the last year. And, and what that is is it's it's our foundation program. So every athlete that comes into our program goes into that developmental group it's our foundation program where we teach the five the five basic patterns what we call which is a squat a hinge an upper body a pull and push horizontal a horizontal plane and then an iso core stability uh, um, section that involves you know stability on the front back sides and then an iso lunge component um, and that's our five that's our five basic movement patterns um, alongside with that we teach you know a big part of it is is our a series so we combine the A series with some of our build-up work and speed and speed development, right? We're teaching some mechanics, um, front side mechanics, arm drive, but the A series for us is great for coordination. So that's another piece. Um, and then we go into the athletic positions. Uh, so many kids don't know the general athletic position, right? They they don't understand how to flatten their back, you know, how to pull their shoulders back, to use their hips to actually load motion. So we teach the athletic positions. We teach snap downs, how to decelerate a little bit how to um, withstand force on the way down. Um, and, and those are kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what we start with in that foundation program. And then as they advance through the uh, years in advanced program, we start building them up um, to more, uh, you know, our, our, our highest level guys. We'll touch on some of uh, Bondarchuk's, you know, exercise classification stuff where we actually start um, integrating the weight room with what they're doing in their skill. So a pitcher, for instance, I've got pitchers that will go throw and they'll come into the weight room and do front leg bracing work. Um, you hear Stefan Jones talking about it. He actually, you know, you guys had a great podcast a, a few weeks back with Stefan. Um, we do some of some similar things where we're integrating skill and strength, right? Special strength exercises. Uh, Verkashansky talked about it all the time. Um, we want to integrate those two so that we can kind of feed off of each other a little bit. Well, and, you know, since you, you've already mentioned Yuri now and, and Anatoly, you are a person who's studied quite a bit of the Eastern Bloc stuff. And baseball's an interesting place to incorporate that because of the history and the allergies at times to the weight room in the past when it came to ball players. But that's kind of changed with how they train now. Yeah, honestly, with the, um, you know, sports science – sports science is doing amazing things with baseball and we're starting to quantify everything. Um, so the, the route that it's going, I think is tremendous. I actually just had an intern today, send me a report. He, um, worked for the Mets over the, uh, over this past season, worked for the Mets and they just tested on all kinds of stuff, right? The, the force decks, force plates, um, the, uh, new groin bar. They just tried stuff out and tested it. Started finding ranges where guys um, were, were kind of most efficient, where guys threw the hardest, uh, guys that were getting injured. They, 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 they looked at those bandwidths and found where they wanted guys to stay, and he sent me the report on everything that they were doing. And it was very, very interesting, um, stuff that in the future hopefully we can use a little bit of. But with the advent of sports science and how we're quantifying everything, I think it's a great direction that baseball is headed. There's some tremendous strength coaches coming into the field. Um, not only at the, um, not only at like the collegiate level, the pro level, but also in the private sector, we're seeing a lot of great stuff happen in the private sector. Um, I actually just spoke at a conference in LA last weekend and t truth be told, it was one of the best conferences for information purposes from a PT, from a strength coach, um, physical performance, um, whatever you want to call it and skill coach involved. Um, it was one of the best clinics that I've ever had that I've ever spoken at, uh, it was called bridge the gap. It was done by 108 performance out there. It was all related to baseball, but so much of the stuff could be taken to other avenues. Right. Um, but it really detailed how 
these coaches, PTs, um, strength coaches, we're all integrating the skill with the physical performance side. So can we run down that a little bit? Let's, let's dive down that rabbit hole. How is this something that coaches can expand upon with what they're doing with their athletes? Well, you know, Bondarchuk talks about it all the time. I know you had guys on there that, that go into this quite a bit. The classification of exercises, you know, it starts with the competitive, competitive exercise, which is basically your event. In baseball, that's easy for me on the pitcher side, right? Because we can actually see what a pitcher does. It's, it's a rep, it, you can replicate the movement all the time, right? Yes, there's variation within it, but it's, it's, a, it's the same movement for the most part all the time. Um, hitters a little bit, same thing in the box, right? But when you take them out onto the field, that's where things can get, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit wild. Same thing in team sports. It becomes tough with Bondarchuk stuff and, and big team sport events that, um, there's so much variability, right? There's so much variability going on that it becomes tough to say, well, this is the competitive exercise because it's there, there isn't an exercise, but with pitchers and hitters, we can classify that. So you've got a swing, a pitch, their throw. Um, from there, we work down to SDE, specific development exercises. Um, movement is the same. Muscles are the same for the most part, right? There's some slight variation. And so that's where we start adding components of uh, our constraint drills, whether it's um, our plyo ball work, where we're working on a specific piece of a throw or a swing or a rotation. Um, it's very, very similar to what they do on the mound in the box, but it's not exactly the same, right? There's, there's pieces that are broken down or uh, we're using a different implement. Um, specific prep, you, you start looking at um, uh, rotational throws, right? Med ball throws, um, jumps, things like that. They're not specific. They're not necessarily specific to the movement, but we're using the same muscles, right? We're using some of the same, same uh, patterns, but we're not completely specific to it. Um, and then you get in the general aspect. The general aspect is, is the weight room for us. Once we get, uh, once those athletes advance all the way up to the top of our, our program, the weight room is completely general. I have guys that don't squat. Um, once they advance into that uh, advanced level, they don't they don't squat with us anymore. They start doing uh, exercises that are specific to what they need, um, and then um, you know the squat becomes very very general, and it's not even a part of our program after you've got a guy that's been in the program three, uh, maybe four years. Um, so I've got guys right now that haven't squatted in two years with us. Um, what they do is very, very specific to what they need. And one of the ways – I'll touch on this real quick too. I had a great conversation with, uh, with um, a coach yesterday about movement screens, right? We do some general movement screens, but really what the screen should become is, is the exact movement that they're doing. And so we have a motion capture lab here that I've started using in the last year with our sports science department, which is going great. We actually dot up the pictures. It's a, um, it's a, uh, uh, it's not a uh, uh, marker. It's not markerless. It's a markered motion capture lab, um, and we can actually get real time feedback as far as what's going on with with uh, every throw. So, for instance, we had a uh, a pitcher in there last Friday. Um, and we changed something in his mechanics. We changed something just like that, threw five throws, looked at velocities, looked at what was going on, threw another five throws different. Velocity instantly went up four mile an hour. We had an average velocity increase of four mile an hour over the next, over the next four pitches. And so that tells me everything I need. And so then we can go back and train according to what he specifically needs in the future instead of you know hoping that well, you know, he's, he lacks, uh, you know, thoracic spine rotation or he lacks, you know, um, he, laps, he lacks hip internal rotation. Kind of guessing at it, we put him in the motion capture lab and we can specifically see exactly what's going on and where we need to make changes in a program. And you do this while they're performing while they're competitive actually perf exercise. Yeah, exactly. While they're doing their competitive exercise. What is more specific than seeing and getting live feedback than what they're doing in their actual event. It becomes no more specific than that. And that's what I actually want to transition all of our screens to is let's watch what these guys, let's watch what these guys do, how they move, where we have mechanical breakdowns. I mean, you know, 
biomechanical efficiency is the most important thing in any sports skill. How efficient is your movement? That's the most important thing in any sports skill, right? With decreased efficiency, we get um, increased stresses at the joints and we get power leaks. Um, you limit force output. So biomechanical efficiency cannot be, we, we can't, it, it just can't be, uh, it's so, so, so important. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. That's that's what that's what gives you a 165 pound pitcher that front squats his own body weight barely, throws 96 or 98 mile an hour versus a freak of an athlete that vertical jumps 36 inches, 240 pounds. You know, a six foot five kid that you'd say, well, this kid, this kid's a freak of an athlete, but then he throws 86 off the mound. How does that happen? How does that work? Well, it comes down to mechanical efficiency and how well you capture. Uh, energy up the kinetic chain. So there's nothing more specific than us actually doing the competitive event and analyzing where we have breakdowns. I love that. But let's take two steps back because you're talking about the progressions and the regressions and how you move the guys forward. Sure. In an individual sport like baseball, an individual team sport, where you're going to have guys who are going to see the older guys doing the, the, the cool things and they know that that's the stuff that's going to carry over and help them the best. How do you keep them back? How do you how do you sell them the slow cook and the take your time and check the boxes? You know, that's honestly a lot of that comes from our. Uh, I think all of that starts at the top, but it comes from our head coach and the way he he sets the program up. Um, I don't have to worry about that. Our kids buy in from day one. And maybe it's just because that's the type of kid we recruit. Um, but that is a huge emphasis from from day one is you got to buy into everything we're preaching. And one of the one of the pictures coach actually uses on the, on the player manual is there's a road. There's there's a path on the right path on the left. Looks super easy. It's paved. It, it um, you know, it, it's it's there's no scary trees and this and that. Right. Um, the path on the right. Rocky. It's going uphill. It's it's covered in branches and trees and this and that. And coach says you kind of have two options. We're going to take you on the path to the right, but all you have to do is follow the path. You have to buy in. It's not going to be easy. We're not taking the path on the left. We're going to take the path on the right. It's going to be tough, but we've already laid out the plan. The plan is already there for you to reach your goal. All you have to do is stay on the path. Just follow the path, and that's one of his big – his big uh, talks from from day one is buying into the system, and so we take these guys through that foundation program, and they advance up through the levels as as you know for the most part they're capable, and the way we kind of program it, a lot of it mixes and matches to where they might not know that they're not doing everything that uh, you know the older guys are doing type of a thing, um, because there's a lot of individual individual work within each program as well, so. Uh, but they buy in from day one, and we, you know, they understand that this is the path we're going to go. We've got to complete these steps before you actually get to advance on and 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 move up the ladder into what those older guys are doing. The buy-in is critical, though. No, and that always gets things to drive forward and move in a positive direction. But then, let's talk a little bit more because I like I like where you're going with how you're identifying and building this. So let's talk about this breakdown that you do with these men and, and what what you're looking at big picture and how you're plugging and playing and then retesting because like, you know, you're talking about abduction, but you could look at that in a bunch of different ways with the pitcher, right? With how they drive or push or turn or whatever. So how is it then... One, how does the identification process go? And then two, what's the recheck? Or is it just running that same evaluation to make sure that it's correct? Well, if we're talking about if we're talking about the actual competitive event, um, so that's just putting them back in the motion capture lab and seeing if we I'll give you an example. One of our summer guys threw in a capture lab, um, threw in the motion capture lab. We see what, what the problem is, and then we go back and design this program built around that. So one of the guys this summer was over-rotating, right? At, at, um, when he picks his leg up at leg lift, he's over-rotating so far that when his hips go, 
his shoulders have to go. So he has no separation. He can't. There's no energy going up the kinetic chain. He just turns as a giant barrel, essentially. So when we see that in the uh, in the biomechanics report, um, we can go back and build a program with his SDE work, right? His constraint drills, med ball stuff. Um, we've got some specific med ball throws for that very thing that we worked on. We can go back and build a program based around that. So we took a three to four week training block, and then this Friday we went and put him back in the lab to see if if things changed, if we made an impact on that. Um, same thing, the previous block with a different kid, front leg bracing was terrible. So we created exercises for a front leg bracing, what, what uh, special strength exercises, safety bar, where uh, a kid might have it on the rack, picks up his front leg and then slams that leg into the ground and does kind of a split squat, a concentric split squat, right? Um, and then we put him back in the lab to see if it changed it after a block of three to four weeks. So that's one of the ways we're looking at it as far as as far as their competitive exercise goes, as they're climbing up the chain through our actual program. And this is the question I get all the time is, is well, how do you know? How do you let a guy that goes from your foundation program, how does he advance to the intermediate? How does he va- advance into the advanced program? There's not numbers. We don't have we don't have a, you know, two times body weight front squat or, um, you know, such and such on the bench press, RDL, vertical jump, anything like that. We don't have that. And I don't have an answer for coaches. The, the only answer I can say is it's the coach's eye. Eventually, more and more strength work does not transfer. It just doesn't transfer. We're wasting time and energy. These athletes have a finite amount of adaptation energy. So we can't just, we can't just keep blowing energy trying to get a heavier front squat, trying to get a bigger deadlift. Um, and, and that's, that's where it comes in. And, and I say, this stuff isn't transferring anymore. This guy is strong enough for what we need him to do. He's going to advance into the, into the next program. Um, right there or not, but that's the best way I can explain it is it's the coach's eye. And when transfer no longer occurs, that's when we have to move forward with more specific means. How are you determining whether or not transfers occur? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's another good question. Um, we don't necessarily, I don't necessarily have have a system set out yet. Um, you can kind of see when when kids get so strong that, I shouldn't say so strong. You can see when kids are, are strong enough and we're not seeing a, a, for a pitcher, for instance, velocity. We don't see velocity increases anymore. A hitter, we don't see uh, exit velocities rising um, in, in the cage. Um do we have a again a finite system that details? Well, this is when transfer has stopped occurring. No, we don't. But um, th- you know that's maybe what we're maybe what we're trying to get to. But I think that's where the motion capture lab comes in now because we can start training a lot more specific to what uh, to what the actual um, you know um, movement, the biomechanics of of their actual competitive exercise are. So yeah, I mean I don't have a great answer for you there. Uh, hopefully somebody will figure that out and tell me. No, but I think that that is the answer, right? Is that you're trying, but if someone is sitting there trying to quantify the unquantifiable, they're just right. going to run around and chase their tail. But you actually are sitting here and looking and saying, well, because you have true KPIs right there. You're talking velocity in a pitch and exit right. velocity when they're hitting the ball. So you have real KPIs. It's not like where most of us in other team sports would look at it and say, well, they're they're getting faster or they're jumping higher or they're fly tens or whatever because those aren't actual performance indicators. Right. And that's, I mean, you bring up a a great point with KPIs. That's where I struggle with KPIs because just because, you know, um, just because such and such, he throws a med ball harder uh, that could be a KPI for some for some guys, right? A, a med ball throw. We we uh, clock it on a gun. Kid throws a med ball harder. Well, hopefully that transfers, and hopefully that makes his competitive exercise better. But that's the that's the key word is that we don't know because we can. That stuff is not specific, right? That stuff is not specific, and so that's where I I run into a wall with KPIs is that. I don't know how to classify, just like you said, quantify the unquantifiable. How do I know? That's not. It can't be a KPI if that doesn't affect if that doesn't affect their actual competitive exercise. So, 
that's where I struggle, and that's why I think Motion Capture Lab and, and what we do, trying to watch some of that stuff is, is so important, I guess. It's such a big key for us in the future. Um, and it's hard to – so many people don't have access. We're so fortunate to, to have that and to be able to use it now that um, I, I hate talking about it because so many people are, are less fortunate and don't have access to, to um, the stuff that we have. So, Right, but at the same time, somebody's got to be the person to – pun intended, pave that path. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're definitely not the first in the baseball realm. We use a lot of resources outside of, outside of, um, you know, our department here for help in that aspect. Um, there's some, there's some smart guys in baseball right now that are doing some really great stuff. So we still have help with that, but yeah, I mean, that's, to me, that's that's the future is of screening is let's just see how they move in their actual movement, and then we can actually figure out what we need to do. You know, shoulder. Here's a good example. Hip shoulder separation is everything. Everybody talks about hip shoulder separation, and we might have had the athlete that was he's a perfect example. He was over rotating when he picked his leg up. So instead of, you know, instead of uh, being kind of a, like a 90 degree angle, his shoulders being at a 90 degree angle to home plate. He was rotating 50 plus degrees away from home plate. And when pelvis would rotate, he's already at end range and he can't capture energy up the chain because what happens with a baseball pitcher, it doesn't matter any rotational, it doesn't matter what javelins, a uh, hitter, a pitcher, the pelvis goes, the shoulders go, the elbow goes, the wrist goes, that's capturing energy up the kinetic chain. And when he's already at end range, and pelvis goes, he had no slack for that thing to capture energy. So everything had to go at once. Um, but on the initial report, it says he's got 50 some degrees of hip and shoulder separation. So then anybody would say, well, we don't need to worry about hip shoulder separation. He's got, he's got plenty. But what we actually found was he had too much and was turning away from the plate and we were losing all that energy instead of actually being able to capture what he had. So, um, a lot of a lot of coaches, a lot of pitching coaches would have looked at it and said, "Well, let's just work on hip shoulder separation. The hips and the shoulders, you know, they they they're not separating like you would normally see, even though he has fifty some degrees. We would have never known that. So it's, I think it's going to be a huge, huge piece for uh, for the future for anybody. Right, and then on top of that, you can still use your general stuff." And now know how long you can use it for. Yeah. So, I mean, we generally see that um, – I'll say this. We generally see uh, velocities climb for the first two years um, pretty easily in our program. I think the guys coming in now are more trained. So 10 years ago, you know, we even said it at the beginning – Baseball was very far behind. Uh, athletes didn't train. They didn't do sprint work in the off season. They didn't lift. They didn't do this stuff year round. This class that we've had come in this year has been has been probably the most athletic um, class that we've had from a basic movement foundation standpoint. Right? They honestly could blow through that foundation program I put in, whereas a lot of classes in the past would have no shot at progressing quickly through that, right? The athletic positions would take, you know, weeks and of, of teaching for them to be able to, for them to be able to stabilize that skill. Um, this class has been, has been great. And maybe that's a testament to the fact that training is kind of coming around in the, in the sport of baseball. Um, so hopefully that's the, uh, hopefully that's the case. Yeah, and I think that great resources like the one right past your left shoulder right there are, are leading the way when it comes to that. Yeah, well, there's a couple, actually. I got uh, James Smith books, probably the one you're talking about back, back there, the uh, Governing Dynamics. That's I got both of his books sitting back there. So, yeah, that's there's some uh, there's some good stuff in, in, his, uh, in his work, honestly. Well, yeah, and movement over maxes is right there too. I I appreciate that. Yes, I appreciate that. <laughs> but listen, man, let me let me get you out of here on this. One, where can people see more of what you're doing and follow you through the socials? And two, where are they going to be able to pick up a copy? Yeah, so uh, social media is Zach Dakin, just my name. Um, Twitter and Instagram. 
Um, I have a blog when I have time. Let's be honest, as a college coach, time is very, very limited. So the uh, blog posts are um, are a hit or miss. But ZachDakin.com, and then you can pick up the book there or at MovementOverMaxes.com. You know, with that at that website, they get videos, all the videos that accompany all of our regressions, progressions to every movement we have in the foundation program. Um, you know, they actually get the templates to the workouts. I took exactly what we do. In our foundation program with every athlete that walks through our door and, and put it in a book. So um, our interns loved it because they said as soon as I opened up the book or as soon as I saw the workout, I knew exactly where we were in in the uh, midst of the book. So it's it's basically word for word what we do. That's awesome, man. And I love the fact that you're sharing what you're doing and putting it out there. Zach, I can't thank you enough for your time today, man. This is absolutely killer stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch soon. And a huge thanks to TCU Zach Dakin for spending the time with us today. Guys, some open, honest, candid sharing. Someone really leading from the front when it comes to development of these athletes, looking to find better ways not just to evaluate them, but better ways to find and deliver transfer, and better ways to make sure that your keep your KPIs, excuse me, actually match the performance. I can't thank Zach enough for being so open, honest, and candid with us sharing today. Keep up the great work down there, brother. It's truly appreciated and really well-noticed, man, so, so keep up the great work. And guys, make sure you're following him on Twitter and Instagram at Z-A-C-H-D-E-C-H-A-N-T um, and hop on over to movementovermaxes.com. Uh, full disclosure, I, I'm receiving nothing for you know the, the publicity for the book. I think it's that good. I think it's something people should have in their hands. Understanding how people run their progressions and build these long-term models, I think, is worth its weight in gold. And this is a sensational resource. So hop on over to movementovermaxes.com and, and pick up your copy, guys, because I, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. It's, it's a really solid resource. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.